Hi, everybody. This is great to welcome you back. This has been an amazing um, event starting at five o'clock, which is hosted by JRAN, a JRAN forum. So for those who weren't here earlier, I'd like to welcome you to the, a very, very timely and important webinar. For those who don't know me, my name is Daniela Jaff Klein, and I've been asked to do a brief introduction this evening. Um, we really, really delighted that you're joining us and um, thank you for participating in this. The first part of the evening was more of a, a local look at the UK's response to the Afghan refugee crisis. Um, we, we had a very, very moving um, account of the transformation that occurred within Afghanistan in, in just within one day and the impact that it had on so many people's lives. And then we heard from a number of people the different um, um, programs and coordinations that are going on on the ground in the UK by a number of organizations. Um, a lot of the challenges that have come to the fore and really, you know, most of these are, are much better tackled as a group, um, which is why JRAN is such an important organization um, this forum has been curated and organized by JRAN. JRAN, if you weren't sure before, stands for the Joint Refugee Action Network. And it's a network of organizations that work within the refugee sector and was created during COVID under the umbrella of One to One Children's Fund. So what JRAN aims to do is to connect and help those in the sector where collaboration is key to share knowledge and where applicable to come up with joint actions. And prior to this, we did do a number of breakout rooms um, where we came up with a few, a few sort of collaborative ideas and hopefully we'll be able to put that into action. But now we've got the keynote address, which is called Judges, Lawyers and Afghan Refugees. And we are incredibly honored to have such a prestigious panel and really a, a very, very amazing group of people speaking to us. Um, the reason why I've been asked to, to introduce you is because I've been involved with another one of one to ones programs, which is called the Future Leaders Program. And that is a three month online program for young adult refugees and asylum seekers based in the UK. And that program aims to equip young refugees with the skills and resources to share their innate abilities and to feel, to feel part of a dynamic community within the UK. So it's my great pleasure, therefore, to invite Barak Batuhan, who's a young lawyer and a refugee from Turkey. He was an, he is an outstanding graduate from our leadership program, and he's going to introduce tonight's discussion. Welcome, Barak. Thank you, Danny. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm really glad to have today, Danny, and her encouragement brighten many days of mine, especially during one to one Future Leaders program. Um, I'm an exiled Turkish lawyer living in London, and interestingly, I'm rebuilding my new career as a first-year law student in the UK. More importantly, I'm trying to be a law-abiding person who strives for freedom and democracy for people all around the world. Well, what am I doing for this, and what does it mean to be in the UK for me? Um, life can be really challenging, but of course, there is many personal mottos out there as people are scampering around on the planet's surface. It is evident that the way to get respect from others is to be respectful to everyone, obviously. Maybe we can't explain to people who sit around with grudges and resentment that the world we live in can be shared with respect and that everyone can live in peace. Somebody's gonna say we do not have equal rights, somebody maybe it's gonna insist that human rights are not universal, but I personally and passionately believe in the rule of law as an important principle with democracy. I'm happy to be here with brave people to talk others and convey the important messages for making a better society with fraternity. So we need definitions by what do you mean by respect and what do you mean by cooperation and to the outcome and the justice we have a great variety of talks ahead of us. And this session will be chaired by Judge Dennis Davis, one of the South Africa's most respected legal minds. He was appointed to a personal chair of commercial law in 1989. In 1989, 1999, he became a judge of the High Court and the president of the Competition Appeal Court in 2000. Since his appointment to the bench, he has continued to teach constitutional law 
and the tax law at the University of Cape Town, where he is an honorary professor of law. And we really do have a wonderful pleasure, the privilege of welcoming the Judge Dan Davis. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be very brief because I want to just try to organize things properly. I'm going to say well, just one thing as a South African, uh, particularly because this is an incredibly important event, judges, lawyers, and Afghan refugees. Why do I say that? Because as a South African, during the height of apartheid, when we were struggling against an authoritarian, awful, racist, and, and sexist regime, which was determined to destroy life for the vast majority of South Africans, those of us, and there were many, of course, who were in the struggle, looked to the outside world and got extraordinary support from many people here and around the world. And it's therefore an unbelievable honor for me to be asked to chair this, because it seems to me that we South Africans who understand precisely what international pressure can do in order to alleviate suffering of others, in our case, under apartheid, that we should also make our contributions. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor to chair such a distinguished group of people. Now, just one point that I want to make, just before we went on air, Baroness Kennedy pointed out to me that she had a time constraint. And I was just wondering if that is so, whether Helena, you would like to speak before I ask Sarah, because I don't want to lose your contribution. Uh, Dennis, that's so kind of you. Um, I was explaining, you can see from where I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the Royal Gallery at the House of Lords um, and I, <laughs> outside of the chamber um, because we're, um, we're having the second reading of the Health and Social Care Bill okay. um, here at Parliament. And, uh, and the, 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 the whole debate should have started much earlier, but it was delayed because of a statement that had come up from the House of Commons. And so I'm afraid it looks as though I'm going to be called upon to speak around about 25 past seven. So if I could speak early on, I would tell you. No, no, that. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to do that right now. And, and Sarah, I hope you, you'll forgive me uh, for changing the order in that particular way. So I'm going to introduce you, Helena, you, you need no introduction. Uh, but to be perfectly frank, for people like myself, it's an absolute thrill to chair a session in which you're in. I was talking to a very distinguished silk in South Africa, a woman today, who, and I said uh, I was going to be chairing a session with Elena Kennedy was there. And she said, when I grow up, even though she's a silk, I'd like to be like Elena Kennedy. And the truth is, um, when I look at some of the books you've uh, 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 written, Just Law in 2004, and Miss Justice, um, how British law is failing women um, in 2019. There have been very important and influential books, apart from all the work you've done uh, over a vast number of years. Um, so many cases regarding terrorism, official secrets and homicide. You've taken over the role of the director of the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute. Uh, and frankly, one of the beacons of human rights lawyers. And it's true, uh, if I was to say to students, you know, if you want a, a model, Helena Kennedy should be your model. So Helena, I'm not going to say anything more over to you. Oh, Dennis, you're a lovely, wonderful man. And uh, you're <laughs> one of my pinups too. Can, can I just, um, I just want to tell you that um, uh, it was just so lovely um, hearing Baruch um, speak about how much the rule of law meant to him and, uh, and the protection of human rights and his belief that human rights are universal values um, and that ones that um, everyone yearns to, to live in freedom. Everyone yearns to be loved and to love. Um, there are yearnings that, which are about the human condition and, and they're encapsulated in the human, uh, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in our human rights legislations um, where we're lucky to have them. And I just love it that here we have um, Baruch who's uh, uh, you know, becoming a lawyer and, uh, and, uh, and who loves the law the way that I love the law, the way that you love the law. And if you're a practitioner in the law, um, it sort of gets into your bloodstream. And so when um, I was told that the women judges in Afghanistan uh, were now basically had, had a, a war had been declared on them because the Taliban had uh, immediately opened the gates of the prisons and allowed um, the, all those who had been sentenced by these many women judges in the, in the years since there had been a return of women into the law 
the, that we had encouraged, the International Bar Association had actually created um, the Afghan Independent Bar um, back in 2009. And so we were involved in training programs and so on. And although I wasn't the director then, I was still involved with the International Bar. I actually uh, co-chaired the Institute of Human Rights at that time. And we did a lot of work, insisting that the, the law schools brought women in to, uh, and opened the, the, the gates to women too. Women became judges. Uh, we encouraged that the, the Istanbul Convention to eliminate violence against women should be introduced into domestic law um, in Afghanistan and women's courts were established and Fozia, um, she'll tell you herself, was, was the, a judge in an, the appeal court um, uh, dealing with um, uh, violence against women and uh, the crimes that were committed against women um, particularly um, because so much um, you know, child marriage, uh, forced marriage, um, viol domestic violence, violence in the streets because, you know, we, we imagined it all ended, you know, um, but it didn't. And if women were considered to be in any way behaving inappropriately because they didn't, weren't dressed properly, men would beat them and, uh, and they, they were being brought before courts. And the women in those courts were sentencing them. These are women who are my sisters-in-law and I always feel that about, um, you know, we use those expressions as the, the way of you describing your brother's wife. But, but these, were, these were other women like me who were in the law to, to in, imbue it with a woman's perspective, to make law um, a, a discourse in which you know, women's voices were also heard. And they undoubtedly um, brought really important uh, contributions to the rule of law in Afghanistan. And as Baruch was saying, it's democracies exist, you know, don't, voting's not enough. There has to be the rule of law. There has to be a vital civil society. There has to be freedom of expression and a free media. And all that's going, it's gone. Uh, women journalists are under attack now in Afghanistan too, and they're in hiding as well. Every day I received a text uh, from somebody um, in terror, living in a basement, Fozia will tell you, because one of the, the changes that's taken place in the last 20 years is also um, the social media and the iPhone is available to, to everybody. And so the women all know what's happening to their, their sisters back in Afghanistan. So as a lawyer who, uh, you know, who believes that these women were making a great contribution to the rebuilding of their nation, um, who were in, many of them actually were, were the judges in the narcotics courts, um, which we funded and, and, and helped support from the UK. And why? Because the narcotics uh, uh, trade, trafficking in, in heroin, was one of the ways in which the Taliban financed itself um, and uh, in order to do, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, terrorism in domestically, but also terrorism internationally. Um, but also, um, that's the heroin that ends up on the streets in our cities. Um, uh, being sold to, to the, the, those who become addicted to it and causing the havoc of the social problems that, that go hand in hand with heroin addiction. So, you know, the, the, these women were not just protecting and building their own society, they were doing a job of work for all of us, um, building a better world. And that's why I feel that we have a duty of responsibility and care to them. And, uh, and so when I got these calls and I received these messages, um, I didn't imagine for a minute I would end up chartering planes, let me tell you that for nothing. I am, um, I've never chartered a plane in my life. Um, but what happened was that I, uh, I started, I, I found out that there were um, organizations in the United States that were um, helping um, religious minorities to get out, Christians and so on, out of Afghanistan. And they were, um, uh, and I got in touch with them think, saying, could you put a few of my women judges in the back of your plane? Um, you know, uh, and, and that was what I imagined might be possible and that we might contribute financially. Um, and then um, they said, we don't have any space. And so what then was, uh, required was that they did they said we'll tell you how to do it we'll put you in touch with people who charter flights we'll um help you understand how to get landing rights and so on how to understand your traffic control i mean you know who knew and so i then had to go with my team i had the most fabulous team of young lawyers at the international bar association human rights institute evelina emily fall 
and, and uh, they're, they're wonderful people. And then Sir Charles Hoare from the Hoare's Bank family is a great um, humanitarian activist. And he came on board to help me with the business of negotiating chartering flights. And then I started raising money and, and listen, I'm still raising money um, because you know, rights mean nothing unless you have decent independent lawyers and judges to, to fight for people's rights, people to um, argue the cases, to prosecute the bad guys, to, uh, to make independent decisions. And that's why we need to protect them. That's why it matters to all of us. And I'm very disappointed that um, um, you know, I'm having trouble. I've got, I've got 103, we did three flights and I've got 103 uh, judges in out and they're in Afghanistan and Fozia, thank God, is here and we had this most delicious event where we went to meet her at the airport um, at Heathrow with some other judges. Um, and, and there she was with her family and her four gorgeous daughters. And, uh, and um, we welcomed her, but, but, you know, she's stuck in a hotel in Earl's Court just now. And before that, she was up in a hotel up near Birmingham. Um, you know, she's been trafficked around the country. And, uh, and we want to find homes for people. And we actually, Britain should be taking in more of the women judges. Um, and they're, all, they're women with great husbands. You know, they're all, they're married to good men who didn't mind having professional wives. You know, these are, these are the good guys. And they too were lawyers and judges and, you know, distant professionals and educated um, men. So these are wonderful people and will enhance any country in which they come. But I'm still struggling. I mean, thank God I've just got Australia to agree to take 20 of the judges from Athens um, to Australia. Um, I'm trying to persuade Canada um, to take um, anybody with influence in any of these places or anywhere in the world that we can persuade to take in. I got, you know, my friend Sandy Toxvig persuaded um, uh, somebody to intercede a, a former prime minister that she knew in Iceland to, we persuaded Iceland to take two. Um, I phoned up Mary McAleese, who'd been the president of Ireland. She and I were law students at the same time. And, uh, and she got onto her folks and, and, uh, and the network then works to, and she, they've taken in 10 judges and their families. So in Ireland, the Irish are great. I mean, we've just got to keep at it. And, um, and of course, it's not helped by the fact that so many uh, governments went into government, uh, populist stuff, you know, um, anti-immigration and, uh, and anti you know, opening your doors to, to people from other places. Uh, we, we know that othering of people and we've got to somehow, um, you know, with a COVID pandemic, but we've also got a pandemic of populist governments that have got there and, and blame um, immigrants for, for the nation's problems when we know that's not true. And so there are struggles to overcome in, in getting nations to, to welcome these people who have really been doing a job of work for all of us in, in, making, um, in, in making the rule of law mean something. Um, and now the sad day has come where the Taliban are back in force, but it won't be forever because the yearning for freedom um, lives in everyone's heart and people will decide that they, this is not what they wanted. And there are women there uh, who, you know, whose sisters and brothers know what they were doing um, and I, I just can't believe that this will, is the end story. Afghanistan will come back again. And uh, but in the meantime, we have to shelter those who were doing such important work on all of our behalf. Thank you very much. Uh, I know you've got to go and, and in the usual course, I would have asked, uh, uh, got a lot of questions, but if I could just ask one, to what extent um, are the legal professions you know, around the world doing anything to assist? Or pressurizing their governments because well, it's, it's so, the thought struck me in relation to south africa the same you know you know we should also be sensitive to precisely this problem and i was just particularly interested whether the route might not been through legal profession uh, association well um listen the 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 the, the um i've been really given good donations, generous donations by um, commercial lawyers here in, in the UK and some of the law firms of uh, sets of chambers have, you know, given us, you know, lump sums, you know, 5,000, 10,000 uh, pounds, 20,000 um, pounds. And so we, we uh, they have been, there, ha there have been people who've been generous. Um, I would have liked to have, uh, of, you know, had the bar making a call out and the law society making a call out to law firms and saying, this is our moment where we, it's a Schindler's List moment, this. 
you know, this really is about um, our responsibility to each other as human beings. And, um, and we forget too quickly the horrors that are involved if you don't act when you have the opportunity to do so. And, and some of our countries don't have great stories to tell when it came to um, what happened in the Holocaust and so on. I mean, we really owe it to, to people to help to do this. And as far as I'm concerned, um, people have been very good to me. Uh, you know, I mean, um, uh, you know, I, I was arriving, a, a plane was arriving in, in Athens and I, I phoned the headquarters of Airbnb and uh, they stepped up, they found us uh, um, some hotels and paid for them um, for a couple of weeks. You know, um, Michael Bloomberg gave me uh, $50,000 to help pay for, buy vouchers of, for food um, in, in Athens. Um, but Sir Michael Hintz, who's a philanthropist, who's an Australian who lives here in London, gave, gave me the money to uh, the lion's share of a flight. A Canadian couple, um, don't want their names to be uh, given out. Another person, a very famous writer, gave me money, don't want to be named. But people have, have really done, 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 done good things and foundations have given me sums of money. And, um, uh, and it's an ongoing thing. If, I could get, if somebody could give me the, the cost of another flight, I would go back in there and see if I couldn't bring the rest of those judges out because we've still got judges there. But I, I would like us all to make a call out to the legal profession. Um, but, um, you know... Um, People know what's going on. At first, I didn't listen. At first, we didn't. When the first fight happened, I did, we did no publicity at all. I didn't, we didn't tell anybody. I just was too frightened that the Taliban would hear what we were doing and somehow make it not happen. But they're actually, um, although they're not in favor of, of, of the fights, they, they've not been as obstructive as we thought. I mean, they did get, um, 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 uh, we had a problem with um, not being allowed to cross the airspace of Iran. Iran withdrew its consent to that. And that, that was at the behest of the Taliban, I'm sure. But, um, but the Taliban want money from the UN and from, uh, you know, they want international support financially and recognition. So they don't want to be seen to be obstructing the, the survival of these women when they know that they are folk on the ground. Because it's the thugs on the ground are going round door to door. I mean, women's houses have been trashed, their books torn up and, and fired, you know. I mean, it's, it's horrible. Uh, and so um, four young women were, were murdered um, three weeks ago in Mazar al-Sharif and they were human rights uh, activists. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is not an invention. This is real. This, I'll it's, just ask you one thing before you go, because um, I know you said 25 past and I'm looking at the clock with well, some care. Could you just perhaps before you go just introduce judge fazia to us because you've obviously uh, well, i want you know, i want you to know that fazia and i spoke while she was still in afghanistan and I, I i made a phone call to her and uh and and i think i now count her as a dear friend because we've gone through a sort of journey together um because we got her and her family onto the flight and I now know her husband and uh, I flew out to, uh, to Athens after we got that first flight out and Fozia was was on it um, uh, with Farad her husband and her four girls and um, and I was I went out to try and to persuade the, in, the min Minister of Immigration in Greece who'd said one flight and that's it and I said I went back out and I begged him and I said please let us have, have get more of these women out and um, I, I said, we'll, I'll raise the money and I'll, we'll pay for their expenses, which, um, uh, and I made a pact, a Faustian pact, that we, I would also get them out by, by Christmas. So, so um, my clock is running down. And so I need the help of all of you out there um, to help me to persuade the, the British government to take some of my women in. Um, and, and if you've influenced anywhere else in the world, help me to do that too but I'm, I'm but but um Fozzie and I we 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 had a sort of wonderful coming together in Athens and we had a sort of uh, a gathering there and uh, and then of course we met at the airport when she arrived and uh, and uh, it was lovely to get to throw my arms around her and to and to say I'm so happy that she's but you're a wonderful woman Fozzie and you've done so many big things Thank you. thank you. Please don't thank, thank me. You. It's really, it's really lots, of, lots of hands went into this, but you're a woman who deserves it and you've done such great work. This is a woman who was the head of the Court of Appeal on, on, for, for crimes against women, so she'll tell you her own story. Fazia, 
That's your best friend. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Fazia. I wonder whether you could tell us a bit about your story. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you for all your efforts too. Fazia, if you could tell us about your story, just about yourself and, and precisely what the conditions are in your country that we greatly appreciated. And it's a great honor to, to ask you to speak to us. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this best, uh, um, this best, uh, um, also uh, you are uh, present here. Uh, who are present in the uh, current uh, this discussion. Uh, thanks for uh, Mrs. Uh, Borunis. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she's the best uh, woman, uh, I think. Uh, we had it in Afghanistan, very more cases uh, about the uh, violence against women. In mm -hmm. every year, uh, we solve it uh, more than uh, 300 cases uh, about the mother cases, and also rape cases and um, uh, everything, every article we have to in this uh, elimination. Uh, it's very, uh, it, it's very important uh, for us uh, or in Afghanistan. It's uh, um, uh, all of uh, women uh, in Afghanistan have very more difficulties in our lives with their husband, with their family, and also about the, our situation. It's very important for us uh, because the, uh, the uh, Afghan women uh, uh, had it uh, very um, have very violent cases uh, in Afghanistan, and also uh, the, they had the first time I uh, was uh, head of a legal department in Ministry of Women Affairs, and I solved it, uh, uh, six uh, thousand cases in one year. It's very more cases. It's very more. But uh, but we had uh, very difficulties. Uh, then we established this elimination uh, for the uh, women about the violence against. They are have very uh, more uh, difficulties and also very uh, our life is very um, uh, not good in our situation is very bad. Can I ask you? Um... You were the head of the Court of Appeals of the Court of Violence Against Women, and I'm, please excuse my ignorance, but uh, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about that. It seems quite extraordinary uh, that there was such a court, and obviously it couldn't have been particularly easy, but I'd be, I'm sure everybody very interested in what kind of work you were doing at the time. Yes. Uh, in the court, we have most, more, uh, very much cases. And, uh, and violence against women. Uh, and uh, the first time the cases or the women are going to a general attorney and uh, we had that one office there. Uh, the, um, uh, pro pro the prosecutor is uh, also work on these cases very much. And then come to um, court, the, the primary court. The primary court also solved their uh, much problems and gave a uh, uh, judicial um, uh, decided on one case. And also, um, we have three, three um, uh, courses. Uh, the primary on appeal on also uh, the, um, uh, our bosses, also another court as a uh, Supreme Court. Is. But the, all of cases uh, coming to uh, my office is mother cases very much in women. And 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 what and has happened now? Very much in and the, and so, sorry, just one sorry? final question for me. Just one final question for me. Could I ask you? Yeah. I mean, obviously there were other judges on your court. I, 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 I take it some of them are still in Afghanistan. And what has happened yes. to them? Yes. Uh, they are also um, going to um, another countries. Uh, one going to in Brazil, and uh, another going to um, uh, came to uh, uh, Greek. And uh, um, more than they are uh, stay now in Afghanistan and have uh, very more problems. Sure. Well, I, I'm sure there'll be questions for you, but I, I, um, if I can move on. Um, Sarah, I'm so sorry that we've, I've had to rejuggle this. Uh, I hope you, you uh, forgive me, uh, but otherwise we wouldn't have had uh, Helena speaking. And uh, 
if I could just introduce Professor Sarah Chandra, who's a, again, extremely distinguished QC, um, uh, honors, uh, a solicitor, professor of uh, clinical legal education, works in the legal advice clinic of the London South Bank University, um, with a hugely lengthy background in what, I, if I could call human rights, what did intrigue me was that she was a founding member of the Colombia Caravana, an international delegation of lawyers monitoring human rights in Colombia and supporting lawyers at risk. Uh, she's been honored as a work for her work. And in fact, that's fantastic because the truth about it is that people like you, and particularly given your role as a clinical legal educator, often you just never get the credit you, you deserve. So I'm delighted that that occurred. And I can't think therefore of anybody better to talk to us more broadly uh, about the wider context of legal professionals at risk um, and how one should respond to that. Obviously, Afghanistan is a quintessential case, but the floor is yours. I think you, you, you muted, Sarah. You muted. Ah. Sorry, it's, it's still um, uh, uh, getting used to um, this after all this time, but thank you very much, Judge Davis. It was a pleasure to listen to Helena ahead of my speech. So I thought that was, and to have Porcia speak as well before I speak. And it's an honor to be part of the event and the, the forum and the workshops have demonstrated what a good deal of sharing of help there is for those seeking a safe refuge from Afghanistan. And I'm going to address three essentials we need in building support, and in particular from the legal community. And firstly, we need vigilance to be able to produce an initial response to emergency situations such as we faced in August in Afghanistan. And that vigilance is based on having a wide range of support in the international legal community. It means that when our colleagues are at risk, then they know where to ask for help. There are international NGOs which monitor the situation which we know about, um, the, where the rule of law, justice and human rights are at risk. We know that Amnesty International and Red Cross, Human Rights Watch and others are there uh, making reports on the ground. And I'm also talking about international legal organizations such as Helena's International Bar Association, um, the Law Society of England and Wales, which I'm a member of the Human Rights Committee, the Bar Council, um, Council of European Bars and Law Societies, and the Federation of European Bar Associations, of which I'm also a member, and the Un Union of Avocat International and others. These are organizations that have the capacity to investigate and to support lawyers at risk in countries where they're persecuted. So in defending human rights, justice, and the rule of law, judges and lawyers are not only persecuted, but imprisoned, attacked, and killed. And they need our direct support. And we know, need to know how best to deploy our support. So how can organizations provide actual support at this stage? There are many ways commencing with an emergency contact with the foreign ministries of our own countries and the international organizations, such as the UN agencies. These initial alerts should be shared widely so that foreign ministries in as many countries as possible our approach to take action at the highest level, including the United Nations. The importance of international scrutiny, which provides a spotlight on the situation of human rights and justice defenders cannot be underplayed. The solidarity provided by the international community saves lives. Visits to countries where defenders are at risk raises the profile of the human rights and justice defenders and provides protection and reports on the visits and testimony from witnesses interviewed in countries visited are published and in addition, trial observations and amicus curiae for the courts all assist in broadening practical support. Secondly, 
our organizations need to have a strong network that is respected in government so that advocacy and support of lawyers at risk is understood and acted upon by those governments that can help. And in order to command that respect as trusted agencies, we need to ensure that our reports are accurate and receive information from trusted informants. This is not something that's built overnight and in legal field involves regular reports from the organizations I mentioned earlier. My own experience with the work of the Law Society of England and Wales Human Rights Committee has demonstrated to me the expertise of our policy advisors and the consistent work on briefings, reports, and meetings with relevant staff at the Foreign Office. The volunteers who work on urgent action letters have protocols to ensure that reports are scrutinized for accuracy. Thirdly, our members should be able to volunteer to assist in whatever ways they can offer, from political dialogue at relevant levels to practical support, such as welcoming legal professionals from conflict areas and campaigning for those at risk. Political non-party support includes writing to MPs, signing petitions and attending meetings and is immensely valuable. There is support, practical support, which can be offered once refugees have arrived. And for example, um, as soon as we knew what was happening in Kabul, ordinary members of the Law Society started offering to help. We have a list of Law Society members who can host Afghan legal professionals, judges and lawyers in the initial stages before settlement, who can provide a welcome in local law societies and legal communities and offer assistance for career progression in this jurisdiction, including mentoring and placement opportunities and assistance to requalify as law lawyers and judges here. Some of our volunteers are providing support to Afghan legal professionals already. I'm now going to illustrate an example for support for human rights defenders in Colombia, a country experienced over 50 years of conflict where paramilitaries kill lawyers and judges with impunity. Like Sina, who you all know, I'm a member of the Colombia Caravana with over 15 years of solidarity and support from the legal community. And the origins of the organization commenced in 2007 when we were asked to organize an international delegation of up to 100 lawyers to visit Colombia. The aim of the delegation was to investigate and report on the situation of human rights lawyers in Colombia, and the delegation would split up and visit several regions so that delegates could hear from human rights lawyers working far from the capital and often isolated in dangerous, life-threatening circumstances. And over the years, refugees from Colombia have settled in the UK and the caravana provides a point of reference for campaigning on human rights and justice issues. There are 22 countries involved in the caravana now with a total of 305 delegation members, some participating several times in visits and providing a permanent basis of support. Caravanas made some headway alongside their colleagues in Colombia in changing the response of the Colombia government to the international community's condemnation of impunity in Colombia. And the caravana has constantly supported defenders of human rights in Colombia by investigating, hearing testimonies, reporting and advocating. And Colombian lawyers experience a rise in their public profile during these caravana visits because press conferences, radio and television interviews give regional and national media coverage. And advocating for individual protective measures as urgent action appeals for particular lawyers at risk have been successful. And the release of human rights defenders from prison is a tribute to the persistence of the international community. The caravana's network and profile in the international community is a form of protection which will continue as long as it is needed. In the words of Colombian lawyers, in greeting the delegation, the caravana saves lives. I conclude by saying there's a message in this example that we must all share 
and that is that we will stand alongside our Afghan colleagues and the Afghan people as long as we are needed to restore the rule of law, justice for all, and respect for human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm going to open to the floor, but I'd like to ask a couple of questions, if I may start with. The, 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 the linkage between the caravana in Colombia and what we're talking about with Afghanistan intrigues me. Did the, the campaigns that you have um, basically mounted in relation to Colombia, did that sufficiently worry the Colombian government so that they had to take steps to protect lawyers or alternatively stop intimidating lawyers? There, yes, we had have some success, in particular, um, gaining entry into government departments and meeting with um, particular uh, relevant ministries in Colombia. Um, the Colombian government likes to present um, that it has a certain amount of human rights protection and um, the use of, uh, it, over the 15 years, there's been a change in legislation to make it more possible um, to protect uh, human rights defenders. And if um, one of the examples I, I have uh, been able to, to show is that um, the embassies in the different countries are very much more open now to conversations with um, delegations uh, of lawyers, you know, the Law Society and the Bar Council, Bar Human Rights Committee um, have meetings and with the embassy in London, for example, and raise and, you know, raise specific um, uh, questions that we're uh, concerned about, which will particularly be about lawyers at risk and um, the cases of lawyers that are detained and imprisoned. So I think that that, that way of being able to um, insist that uh, our colleagues have the support of the international legal community and to make that as broad as possible. So the network of 22 different countries where others can go, um, there is always um, a, a, a strong sense. And uh, every year on the 24th of January, um, there is a day of the endangered lawyer and next January it will be Colombia. And so for those delegates will be able to make their point in embassies all over um, the different countries. Hey, I, just before I ask my second question, can I just reiterate to everybody on the call that if you use the chat line, I'll read out the questions and ask either Fazia or, or Sarah uh, any question that you want to put to them. But let me just put a second question to you, Sarah. Um, much of what we've been talking about, particularly if I, if I focus on, and Fazia, you're very welcome to respond to this too. Much of the work that Fazia was doing was clearly in a sense, protecting women. It was about the idea, as I understand, and she can tell much better than I can, about the protecting of women in relation to violence. And I suppose what's worrying me is that I never thought I'd be living in a world where women's rights are in many countries on the retreat. I mean, the United States of American Supreme Court is likely to overrule Roe versus Wade. Hardly, as it were, an example of kind of defending women's rights. And I mean, I suppose I'm really asking you just the level of anxiety that one now feels that the wind is blowing so violently against the expansion of women's rights rather than since it's blowing for the contraction thereof. And I don't know if you've got any comment on that. Or am I just being too ruddy gloomy? Well, it is part of vigilance, isn't it? To, for us to, to know um, what is happening in, in, and to uh, be very much aware of, as you say, this, it's, a, it's a cold wind blowing back the, the rights of women and girls. And it is uh, vital that we in the international community are there to support the work that Bosi has been doing and to ensure that we protect the future of women and girls by um, providing safe haven now for those judges who have done this amazing work and, and we need them to be able to be there to continue in future. 
Well, that's the point, Fazia. I wanted to ask you. I mean, you here in 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 London, and thank goodness you're safe. And I'm just pleased to hear that some of your colleagues have likewise gone to safe places. But I suppose what it means in the short term is who is there to protect women's rights at all? Because you none of you are there. I'm not blaming you. It's not about blame. In fact, to the contrary, I'm very relieved you're here. But it's obviously a question that one wants to worry about. I mean, do you have hope that at some point this will turn around and some of you may be able to return to your own country and continue the work you were continuing? Yes, I want to have the first time, uh, the first time want to uh, uh, say something about our people or our judges. They are have now some uh, problems in Kabul uh, because uh, they are uh, they are now in, uh, now so they are suffering uh, from suicide attack, exclusion, and killing, uh, fear at lack of duty in any moment in high risk situation. Uh, today we have 93 female judges in Afghanistan mm, are uh, struggling uh, with all their problems with their families and they want to be evocated also. Uh, they wanted to get out. Uh, they have been uh, waiting for a month now because they are have uh, no uh, have jobs, no have uh, money, or um, have very more problems in uh, Kabul in Afghanistan. And also our um, judges or our women also uh, who are um, uh, in Greece, uh, they are also have uh, very more problems in our visas, extend our visa and also uh, uh, they are having, uh, they are wanted to Awoja uh, um, or also uh, the Oibor Association help uh, them. Yeah, they are very much uh, uh, no food, no um, anything. They are they, they must uh, they are uh, have very much uh, problems in their. They wanted to uh, also um, the Awoja agreement or also IBA uh, in Greek uh, government uh, for funding uh, during the stay. They are waiting for the Awoja or also IBA response as soon as possible because they are. Uh, visas is ex expired now. Uh, the the, the uh, women judges uh, 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 the not uh, have uh, their final um, uh, country now. And uh, they are live in um, uh, Greek and have more problem. And also our judges or uh, our women live in Abu Dhabi. They are also have very more difficulties there and uh, their families, their children. Uh, very much a more problem. And uh, women are uh, faithlesses and uh, they want to uh, their final decision uh, to be now, uh, but they are not now now. Uh, it's it's big problem uh, for women and um, and also uh, our judges. Uh, they are have uh, their banking account fees now and also uh, very more difficulties or problems uh, they and their families have to now. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to just ask if there are any questions, otherwise I'll hand over uh, to Danny. Uh, and I'm just going to make one final comment before then handing over because I can't see any. Um, and it's this, I I'm delighted we've had this event because, you know, one gets on with one's life and one forgets that their judicial colleagues in places like Afghanistan, lawyers, who really have been caught high and dry uh, by the appalling situation in which they find themselves. And it's just incredibly important uh, that we highlight your situation, Fazia, and those of your colleagues, and that we constantly do something about it. The worst thing that can happen is to forget this and leave people completely isolated to authoritarian tendencies of the worst order. So. I just want to thank the organizers for this because I think it's incredibly important. And, and my, may I say um, how much I admire the fact that an under, it's all very well, you know, having been a judge for 23 years, I should tell you, it's quite difficult being a judge at the best of times, but being a judge in Afghanistan, I can't even begin to imagine the pressures that you must have been under and you know, just, you know, bravo. Uh, Dani, over to you.
Uh, hi, thanks, thanks, Dennis. And thanks, Sarah and Fazia. I'm sorry, Helena's not here at the end. I think David wanted to actually wrap up, but just before he does, I... I um, oh, sorry, I was, I was following instructions. <laughs> You, you were following instructions too well. You were right. Thanks, Dennis. But but just you know, as a, having having studied law in South Africa and being a, a grandchild of Jewish refugees, I think um, we started this forum or we advertised it with the words of Elie Wiesel, which is that any suffering. I don't know the exact quote, but any human suffering is the suffering of us all, and we all really are responsible <clears throat> for 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 everybody. Um, and I think Helena's term sisters in law um, again refers to all of us. I think, you know, brothers or sisters in law, we really have a responsibility, especially the law community, um, to those who have worked in law and, as Barack has said, are trying to uphold the, uphold the rule of law for all of us. So thank you to Jay Ren, thank you to Zena and Juliet who have done a fantastic job of pulling this together. Um, David, sorry, I. I know you were going to wrap up, but over to you. Sorry, just wanted to unmute. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you wrapped up <laughs> because you said it all. Um, there was an outstanding uh, session. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Judge Fawzia. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you, Danny and, and Borak. And Borak, your... Um, your opening uh, remarks were left a, a really strong impression, and um, and 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 really, I think it, uh, it it you put across those elements of um, that are so so dear to to all of us. I think who are on this call in terms of and if you can encapsulate it in one word, it's respect and respect for each other, respect for the rule of law. Uh, and respect for um, for 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 the communities in which in which we live to make them better places, and that's what we're trying to do at um, at JRAN at One to One Children's Fund. Whether at One to One we work in um, South Africa uh, extensively, uh, Dennis, and um, and we're in some of the most difficult and, and, and uh, challenging areas of, of, of the country in the rural Eastern Cape. And, um, and that, uh, you know, that's, I think that's where we've all got to, we've got to try and, um, and, and, and work together in, 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 in these most difficult places. And Afghanistan is probably the most difficult of all right now um, for, for, for different reasons, but not any, but but ultimately they're the same. They're the same reason, and the, and and the reason, and and the rationale is humanity, and respecting each other's humanity, and um, you know huge credit to um, to Helena for for um, getting behind this rescue mission um, to bring judges, women judges, out of Afghanistan. Great to have you with us, Fazia, and I just hope that you are given a platform. To, um, to governments around the world to um, encourage and tell them what can be done and what needs to be done in order, to, um, in order to make people safe. And it's not only those getting people out, it's, it's, it's once they are out um, to welcome them into our communities and to integrate them in a way that only we as JRAN um, uh, is an example of working together and the themes that came out of our JRAN forum earlier were, you know, community um, uh, and, and creating safe spaces for, um, you know, for, for, for people who have experienced such trauma and re-traumatization. Um, we heard uh, from, um, from one, one uh, person, I forget his name now, someone remind me, um, who, uh, who, who, who told us about, you know, just seeing what happened in August in Afghanistan. He'd been out for a while, for a long time. He'd been working in the media, and um, he was totally re-traumatized by, 
and taken back to that position. And therefore the mental health issues that we are addressing, uh, the example of RTI, the Refugee Trauma Initiative was put on the table. There is so much, if anyone, everyone should get hold of that uh, PowerPoint that was put on the table, you see all the touch points of, in mental health that need to be addressed. But ultimately it's supporting each other. And that's what this is about. That's what JRAN is about, right at its court, supporting each other, working together. Together we can make a much bigger difference. And there's a lot to do on the South Afghanistan front. And thank you all for giving us the inspiration to, to you know, leave this uh, seminar, this forum this evening and go out tomorrow and work with even more energy to right the wrongs that are in front of us. So thank you everyone. And um, again, to our speakers and to Dennis for chairing tonight so, so brilliantly. Uh, we're four minutes early, which is the best I've ever done. Um, <laughs> I can fill the four minutes if you like, but I won't. I'll call it a halt and close now. And thank you for three wonderful hours. <laughs>